It's live. Good evening, family and friends. Welcome to our Facebook Live. Tonight, I'd like to welcome you to our 11th Congressional District Candidates Forum. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Staten Island Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority and the North Shore Staten Island Section of the National Council of Negro Women. My name is Pardis Powell McGoy, and I will be your MC tonight. So happy to have you all with us for this very important event. I just want to state that this event is nonpartisan and all registered candidates have been invited. At this time, I'd like to introduce our first sponsor. Yolanda Scott is the president of the Staten Island Alumni Chapter, and she will offer greetings and tell us a little bit more about her organization. Take it away, Yolanda. Thank you, parties. Good evening, family and friends. I bring you virtual greetings on behalf of the ladies of the Staten Island Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Again, my name is Yolanda Scott, and I am the chapter president. Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated is a private, non-for-profit organization. We were founded on the campus of Howard University over 107 years ago in 1913. The sorority's purpose is to provide assistance and support through established programs in local communities throughout the world. Since its founding, we have over 324,944 women who have joined this illustrious organization. The sorority currently has both collegiate and alumni chapters totaling 1,055 located in the United States Canada, Japan, Germany, the Virgin Islands, Bermuda, Bahamas, Jamaica, and the Republic of Korea. Staten Island Alumni Chapter, which is affectionately known as the Little Chapter with the Big Heart, was chartered on January 20th, 1996 by 23 members. We provide an extensive array of public service initiatives. And over the past 24 and a half years, have implemented several projects and signature programs. Each year through our local fundraising efforts, the funds we raise are utilized to support our community public service events and allows us to provide two deserving graduating seniors with our Melody Scott DeCure Scholarship in memory of our beloved chapter member. SIAC so also developed the Teresa A. Gallishaw Undergraduate Mentoring Program and Scholarship for both Black and Latino women attending college, which is also in memory of our beloved chapter member. Prior to this unfortunate pandemic, SIAC would serve the community both volunteering in a monthly basis at the soup kitchen and pantry at Trinity Lutheran Church. We would also visit local nursing homes, assist with the distribution of toiletries, supply food, and provide warm items of clothing to Project Hospitality and other local shelters. We have recently adopted a neighborhood school, which is PS44, where we have conducted a mid-semester back-to-school supply drive, a month-long book drive, which culminated into a book tasting where the teachers were able to select both books of new and gently used for their classroom, as well as the school library. In addition, SIAC provided the two top reading winners with the Kindle tablet. I tell you guys this evening, this event would not have been possible without the hardworking members of the Social Action Committee, chaired by Sora Michelle Achangpong. I am immensely proud of this committee's work and I just wanted to publicly acknowledge them. To our guests joining us this evening, I say thank you and I would like, to let, I would like for you to know that our efforts that we serve here on Staten Island could not be possible without your continued support. If you would allow me to make a few announcements on behalf of SIAC with both our ongoing and upcoming events. We currently are in the midst of our African American Expressions virtual catalog, catalog shopping fundraiser. 
On Sunday, November 1st, we will be hosting our Cooking with the Deltas via Facebook Live from 2 to 3 p.m. And from November 27th through December 6th, we will be hosting a virtual auction fundraiser. For additional details, flyers, and event registration, please feel free to log on to our website at www.dstsialumni.org. You can also follow us via our social media platforms at Facebook, DST Syac, Instagram, at Staten Island Deltas, and Twitter, DST Syac, all of which you can find located in our comment chat section here this evening. At this time, I know my Soro Pardis will introduce her, but I would just like to also say to my friends and my sister organization president and partner for this evening's event, Nicole Myers. Thank you for joining us. She is part of, she is the president of the North Shore Staten Island section of the National Council of Negro Women. Again, thank you for joining us this evening. Have a great evening and enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda, my sister. I so appreciate the welcome invitation and um, am thrilled to be partnering with the Delta Sigma Thora SIAC um, on this congressional candidate forum to ensure that our members, families, and communities um, are informed voters here on Staten Island and in Brooklyn. Significant challenges facing our families and communities to de today demand that we find ways to optimize our resources to work more effectively. Historically, positive change comes about when there's a coordinated focused effort put into action. And so I thank you always for continuing to partner with NCNW. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the history of NCNW, how it got started. Um, Mary McLeod Bethune was a child of slave parents, a distinguished educator and an advisor to President Franklin D. Roosevelt. This gave her an ear to one of the first presidents willing to listen to concerns of the Black community. But there was a problem. Black activists, especially women, were not having their voices heard. Their concerns were many, but their outreach was very small. To fix this, in 1935, almost 85 years ago, um, in December, Bethune created the National Council of Negro Women to serve as an organization of national organizations. Its mission is to lead, advocate for, and empower women of African descent, their families, and communities. Dr. Janetta Besh Cole serves as our national chair and has ushered in a new era of social activism. NCNW is the largest umbrella organization for Black women in this country, with more than 2 million members representing 32 national and 250 community organizations. In fact, Congressional District 11 is served by two of our community organizations, the North Shore Staten Island section, as my sister has already mentioned. And also, we have a section in Brooklyn. Uh, we have several sections in Brooklyn, actually. Um, but today's questions actually were in partnership with our Brooklyn section. Um, today, NCNW's programs are grounded on a foundation of cr critical concerns known as the four for the future. NCNW promotes education with a special focus on STEM, um, good health and wellness. We promote civic engagement, including advocating for sound public policy and social justice. We encourage um, entrepreneurships financial literacy and economic stability. So our section has been involved in the Good Trouble Get Out the Vote community collective effort, which has been led by Councilwoman Debbie Rose, who is not running, so this remains part of nonpartisan. Um, 
We are ensuring citizens exercise their right to vote by organizing free transportation for seven neighborhoods and their respective early voting sites, which differ from the regular sites. This service is available every day with daily stops in each neighborhood. And I am one of the transportation coordinators for this effort. I wanna ensure that you have a seat on the bus so that you can get your vote in. And so I'm asking you, if you need a ride to the polling site, we have a number that you can call and an email that you can um, utilize. And that number is 347 847-841-6427. 347-841-6427. What did I say? I hope I didn't say anything else. 347-841-6427. And the email is Staten Island GOTV 2020 at gmail.com. That's Staten Island, get out the vote 2020 at gmail.com. No periods, no dashes, straight Staten Island GOTV 2020 at gmail.com. Through our health and wellness efforts, our section stood up a women's trekking group um, in concert with Girl Trek, which is also um, a black women's organization that promotes self care through walking. Uh, we post daily walks um, and encourage women and their families to walk and post those walks, either independently or with the group. Today, we have over 175 women that have joined, so we're really super excited about that. Um, we are, we've come together and we will continue to come together with our national affiliates, Delta Sigma Thoras, Sigma Thetas, Alpha Kappa Alpha, Sigma Gamma Rho, Sorority, and Lambda Kappa Mu, and other local organizations to deliver collectively, personally deliver fresh foods to our seniors in community organizations. We're also planning a pen pal system for seniors in nursing homes. Handwritten notes are critically important and brighten anyone's day, particularly our seniors who are in nursing homes and may be in isolated um, situations because of the coronavirus. So um, just because we're social distancing does not mean we have to emotionally distance. And so we are standing those efforts up to ensure that we stay connected with our um, seniors. Another program that we're super proud of, and I'm going to stop soon, <laughs> is the High School Academic Scholarship Program, which includes college prep um, workshops and our adoption of a school, actually, it's also 44. We send them to Sandy Ground um, to learn more about their history. Um, finally, um, like many nonprofit organizations, COVID-19 has, has had a financial impact. And so to ensure that we are successful in organizing and operating all of our programs, we're holding a virtual holiday gala on December 4th. You can find out all the information about all these programs and much more at our website, which is ncnwsi.org or on Facebook at also ncnwsi.org. We have um, a Twitter account as well, ncnwsi.org. And with that, I wanna thank you for um, listening to me, encourage you to get out the vote and call if you need a ride, because we're there for you. Um, and I want to turn it back over to my sister, Pardis. Hello. Is everybody? Thank you, Nicole. There's just so much amazing work being done on the island, and I'm just really excited, as well as in Brooklyn. Um, yes. It's both talked about getting out the vote and um, early voting. Um, if you look on um, our web, um, our Facebook page, there is um, some information about where to go to vote early and also to make sure that you know your polling sites. And if you need a ride, please don't hesitate to call. Um, that opportunity is available for you. At this time, I want to introduce um, my Sora, Michelle Achimpong. Um, who is going to be, along with Nicole Myers, 
your, um, your moderators for the evening. Um, I just want to clearly state that both candidates, both Max Rose and Nicole Maliotakis were invited, um, but only one um, accepted. And that as Nicole mentioned, the questions were made in conjunction with people from our communities, both sections of the NCNW, um, the Soros of um, Staten Island alumni chapter, as well as people in the community. Um, so there are pre-selected questions and we will not be taking questions from the chat. It's been disabled. Um, so with that said, um, I'd like to introduce um, Congressman Max Rose, um, just to tell us a little bit about him. And after that's um, done, we're going to wait for him to join us. We wanted to have a moment to talk with you before he came. Um, now, Councilman, um, Congressman Max Rose is an Army veteran and a former nonprofit health care executive. He currently serves New York's 11th <clears throat> Congressional District, representing Staten Island and South Brooklyn. He lives um, here in Staten Island in the St. George neighborhood with his wife and his son, um, and is um, our incumbent. Um, so at this time, we're going to um, take a break and wait for him to join us. And then Michelle and Nicole will begin to um, to start and, and ask questions of him. Oh, perfect. Right on time, Congressman Rose. So can you, what can I you like see me? Can you... we can't see you, but we can hear you. All right. I, I'm working. I'm 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 gonna work my magic. Yay! <laughs> I like the magic. <laughs> it's so wonderful for you to join us. I just um I just want to thank you um for coming to this um very important forum. Um our community has lots of questions. We have lots of concerns. And as we get closer to election day, we want to make sure that we're making informed decisions. Um, so again, thank you so much for taking your time to be here with us tonight. And I just want to um, clearly state just a couple of things. As we said, um, both candidates were invited um, and um, Congressman Max Rose has accepted. We have asked him to make an opening remark um, for approximately five to seven minutes addressing the following um, opening questions. Um, our community would like to know, what is your role as a Congress member um, rep um, representing the 11th district? And why do you think that you're the best candidate? Um, so thank you so much and I'm looking forward to hearing your response. Well, Margie, thank you so much. Um, and uh, to Delta Sigma Theta and to NCNW and President Nicole Meyer, so you get to see you and Michelle, Michelle, we, um, <laughs> Michelle, I have so much love for you, Michelle. I really do. I really do. And uh, Yolanda Scott, um, thank you all so much for your leadership on a, on a very fundamental level. I work for you very fundamental level it, that's the most beautiful thing about democracy isn't it and it, i've never forgotten that and i never will forget that when i forget that i gotta go i gotta go so when you look at my job my north star when it comes to my job is if it matters to you it matters to me now that does not mean we always agree anybody who says I'm going to agree with you every single time. They're lying, they're naive, they're incompetent, or they're lacking in the IQ department. I would never, ever lie to you or insult your intelligence by saying that we're always going to agree. But what I will tell you is this. I have and I will always give you everything I have. Give you everything for the community. And I will always give it to you straight, and I will always put our shared values first and foremost. And every single community 
every single person. They're gonna they're gonna be treated equally in my eyes as the congressman. Always. Now, in my first couple of years, we've accomplished a tremendous amount in a world that none of us could have predicted. I got sworn in during the height of the longest government shutdown in our nation's history. It feels like a five lifetimes ago, doesn't it? Uh, we have the largest Coast Guard base in the country, or one of the largest. They had to start a food bank. I, I was one of the few members in Congress to donate the entirety of my first month's salary to charity because I felt like if they weren't getting paid, I wasn't going to get paid. Donated to their food bank. Donated to Camelot House. Moving on, then we, we went to, from the border crisis to impeachment to now COVID and a massive, massive economic crisis associated with it. All the while, we still got stuff done from dealing with the opioid epidemic head on, something that is, is affecting every single community. Led the way as a new member of Congress to increase funding for substance abuse treatment by over $100 million. Led the way to put sanctions on international pharmaceutical companies that are producing illicit fentanyl that's coming, driving into our communities and killing our kids and killing our neighbors and killing our loved ones. Fought each and every step of the way to be there for our public servants. Passed the Victims' Compensation Fund, a $30 billion effort for 9-11 first responders. Got the legislation done to be there for, to, to get the seawall project finally initiated. Did something on the traffic front. Got split tolling done. It's going to take thousands of trucks off the road. And certainly during COVID, it was my honor to make sure that Staten Island for once didn't have to take a back seat. Got the city's first drive-through testing site right on Staten Island. Stood up a COVID-only facility right on Staten Island. These are things that we didn't think were possible. And then certainly went out there with the young leaders and stood and called for, for this nation to fulfill its promise. Did so in cooperation in conjunction with law enforcement and showed the nation that St and Staten Island showed the nation that we can have peaceful calls for justice. I think that's significant. During COVID, brought home over $100 million to the district from for our small businesses, direct on uh, stimulus checks, extended unemployment, fought to change the PPP program with small businesses. When we found out that small businesses were actually the only ones that were getting cash were the ones that had great relationships with big banks, made sure that minority owned businesses were getting their fair share, made sure that community banks were getting funds. But now our work is not done. We got so much more work to do amidst an era of unprecedented vitriol where it appears like people are willing to rip this country apart at the seams in order to win an election by one vote. But I think about the community and I think about the beautiful cultural mosaic that I'm so honored to represent. I think about the soldiers I served with in Afghanistan. I think about the public servants we live amongst who risked their lives during COVID. It makes me realize, it reinstills in my heart the fact that I, I hope to do this so long as the great people of this district will have me. And with, with that, I, I just thank you so much again for the honor of getting the, the chance to have this conversation. I thank, the, uh, thank you all for your extraordinary leadership, and I look forward to hearing your questions. You're on mute. Thank you so much for that. We really appreciate um, your opening statement. I just want to give a little context for our first set of questions um, that are going to be asked by questioner um, Michelle Chimpong. Um, and so I'm going to um, read a statement just to kind of give context to what um, our community is thinking. The stimulus packages have failed to include aid to state and local governments hard hit by the coronavirus pandemic. Without federal support, the revenue loss will impact all governmental services, hospitals, schools, transportation, et cetera. In New York State and New York City, government budgets have been crushed by the loss of revenue, placing thousands of jobs in jeopardy. As you know, on Staten Island, public service positions are a large part of your constituent base. 
compounded by the economic impact, the pandemic has had a devastating impact to the health and safety of many residents, particularly in the northern section of the borough where people of color, particularly African Americans and Latinos, outnumber other races. And so we have um, a few questions along with that context. Um, Michelle, I pass it to you. Um, actually, it's, it's- Oh, it's you, Nicole. Yes. I'm sorry, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Congressman Max Rose. Please call me, Nicole, please call me Max. Okay, okay. <laughs> I will, I, I will oblige and call you Max, thank you. Um, Max, what plans do you have to support and revive the economy that will contribute to District 11 infrastructure? Well, that's a fantastic question. I think that there's really three things that we have to consider as we look forward. I mentioned some of the things that we have already done to make sure that uh, quite frankly, our economy didn't die before our eyes. We have to realize and embrace the fact that this is a public health crisis. Yes, but the economic crisis is intimately tied to the public health crisis. I.e., if we do not de deal with this pandemic head on, then we will not be able to fully recover from the economic crisis. So that's point one is the pandemic. And on the point of the pandemic, we've got to one, everyone's got to wear masks. We have to make sure that masks are available, fully assert the Defense Production Act to make sure that we are producing PPE at a sustainable level domestically. So we're not reliant on a global supply chain. Number two is, is that we have to dramatically scale up testing so that we can engage in actually proactive rather than reactive testing. Uh, we can't just put all our eggs in the basket of the vaccine. Number two, and, and you know, if you think about testing, that's again why for adequately funding utilizing the Defense Production Act is so significant. You, know, you can imagine a world where we're testing far more people. Uh, San Antonio right now is experimenting with that, for instance. Uh, the, the third thing on the point of the pandemic is obviously racing to the vaccine, uh, making sure that that is adequately funded and then instilling the trust in the community that uh, folks will be comfortable taking the vaccine. On the economic front, we need COVID relief and we need COVID relief right away. And I am not such a hyper partisan that I believe that we should wait until the next election to do that. Not, and I don't think anyone who's suffering right now wants us to wait five months. Now, that does not mean that we should have a skinny bill you know, like what Mitch McConnell has proposed. No, it means that we need something robust and bold and nonetheless bipartisan. And that looks like a, the bipartisan framework that I proudly put forth along with the Problem Solvers Caucus. 1.5 to $2 trillion that includes everything from additional direct stimulus checks to extended unemployment to yes, state and local aid, which is so vital for New York City and New York's 11th Congressional District. Otherwise, our public servants are gonna get laid off. Social services will get cut, transportation will get cut, and transportation, and we know this on the North Shore, transportation is a social justice issue. We need the uh, bus rapid transit finally instituted. We need more buses, faster buses, the whole nine. That's state and local aid right there. We don't wanna see tolls go up as well. But the third thing, and this is often being overlooked in this day and age, is we have got to have a substantive, earth-shattering infrastructure bill, one that really sets the tone for the coming decades. And I believe that that is possible in, this, in 2021, something that invests in our roads and our bridges and our highways and our public transportation systems, but also starts to put us on a footing to address climate change with resiliency projects and new energy technology research and battery technology research, something that is totally holistic in nature, but one that justly puts people back to work, expands the middle class, doubles the number of union members, and makes sure that as we double our union members and double and expand the middle class, that that looks like America. That our union members and the middle class look like this country. That's what they, that's the, that's gotta be the North Star for what we're working on. And I supremely believe it's possible. I would not be in this business if I didn't think it's possible. I'm a fourth generation New Yorker. I've had a union member in my direct family for over 75 years. I would not be with you all today, albeit virtually, were it not for the union movement's ability to put my family in the position of a middle-class family. Wouldn't be there. So I, I, and that's something I'll never forget. Thank you.
You mute it, Nicole. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Oh, thank, you. thank you for the phenomenal question. Um, my next question is about the Affordable Care Act. What is your position on the Affordable Care Act? Look, my, my, my position is, is that we have to build upon the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act re uh, represented a significant step, but there's more work to be done. Let's not forget, though, that this is also why elections are significant. Uh, I asked my opponent, Nicole Maliotakis, a very simple question during our debate. I asked him, well, did you think when Dan Donovan voted to protect Obamacare, do you think he did the right thing? She refused to answer. She refused to answer. That tells you everything that you need to know. But as we look to build upon our healthcare infrastructure, there's a few things that we have to do. One is, is that we have to continue to march towards universal healthcare via expanding marketplace subsidies so there's not a subsidy cliff. cliff. We have to also make sure that states are equipped and empowered to expand Medicaid as New York has done. I think that those two things are enormously imperative. And then uh, once we are in a, a, a situation where we can do it, where we know that we're not reducing Medicare, we have to think about the capacity to slowly and incrementally lower the age of Medicare eligibility so long as we can do that responsibly. Uh, but we also have to consider health care costs, not just health care coverage. It's one reason why I was such a proud co-sponsor of H.R. 3, which was the which gave the federal government the capacity to negotiate the price of Medicare drugs, pharmaceutical drugs. We're the only industrialized nation in the world that doesn't do it. It's ridiculous. It's poor business practice. These guys, Donald Trump ran saying I'm a businessman. What kind of businessman doesn't negotiate? Come on. But then as we negotiate the price of pharmaceutical drugs at the med uh, for Medicare, we should also make those prices available for commercial insurance companies as well. That way that, that the, 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 the benefits and the fairness of it all can flow down to the entire marketplace. I think if we either do those two things, it will do a tremendous job to bolster the existing system as well as to expand it and make it more cost effective. Okay, thank you very much. My next question is about um, inequities. What plans do you have to correct the longstanding inequities and enhance economic security and opportunities for women and prevent the pandemic from pushing women further back economically? Absolutely. Well, the first thing is, is paid, paid family leave and paid family and paid medical leave. Okay. And that's something that I'm a proud sponsor of something that we got to get across the finish line. That should not be something that only some people have. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, I, my wife and I welcomed a, a child into this world. Uh, in early March, we adopted a baby boy, uh, a pandemic baby. Uh, and I think about how much work it was. How, I mean, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd heard that it was work. Oh, my God, I had no idea. Uh, and to think that we couldn't make. And, and, and also how those moments were just you, cherry. You don't get those moments back, right? It's so important. And to think that we're not supporting young mothers in their professions with, with paid medical, uh, paid family leave, I think is so, and paid maternity leave, I think is so significant. Um, the second thing, though, as we look at inequities, I really look to the earned income tax credit as something that's very, very significant. Uh, expanding that, I think, is a significant thing that we can do in the tax bill. But also, when we're evaluating all of our public policies, we just spoke about infrastructure. I made it a point to emphasize to you that as we consider increasing union membership, as we consider expanding the middle class, we also have to make, make, a, make it imperative that that spending is done in a just manner. That that spending that is done in a representative manner. Uh, it, this, the, the second that we stop looking at these, these things in silos is the second that I think we can actually start to do them effectively. Uh, as we think about uh, you know, women as well, we also have to think of uh, making sure that a woman's right to decisions regarding her own reproductive health is protected. Which is something that I ardently believe, ardently, and I'm, I, I'm not willing to compromise on. I'm a big believer in compromise, but that's not something that 
that I can budge on. Uh, and then lastly, it is making sure by renewing the uh, Defense Against Violence Against Women's Act that um, that no woman feels alone in the face of domestic abuse and domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you for that. So my next question is about wages and benefits. Essential workers and women have suffered low wages, lack of benefits and inadequate protections both long before and during the pandemic. This is particularly true of black and brown women in caregiving and food related professions. How do you propose to address these inequities? That's a, it's a fantastic question. Fantastic. It hits a nail on the head. Everyone liked to call people, not liked, I don't think anyone particularly got joy out of it, but everyone was calling folks essential during the heights of COVID, right? Yeah. Uh, we saw companies give momentary raises, and now we're, they've stopped those commercials, haven't they? This is why unions are so important. This is why I led the effort to make sure that the PRO Act was passed on the floor of the the House of Representatives to make it easier to organize, not harder. Easier to organize, not harder. Uh, and if you look at our unions in New York City, they are and are becoming more and more representative. I think that's a good thing. The work is not done yet, though, by no, by no sense of the word. But organizing means that you have power. And power is what matters in this business, through and through. I know you know that. Secondly, we have to make sure that we're holding companies to a standard. I'm suing Amazon right now for the ways in which they, they treated their workers during COVID. My name's right on that. The, the next thing, though, is that we have to make sure that we're acknowledging what so many people are going through right now, from our supermarket attendants to so many others. And that's why I am a supporter of hazard pay, a past hazard pay. But it went to languish in Mitch McConnell's legislative graveyard, amongst so many other things. And then so, sincerely, we think, uh, raising, uh, I, I am a supporter of raising the minimum wage nationwide. Uh, because work, work should be dignified. Thank you. Thank you for that information. So my last question before I turn it over to my sister Michelle is about the um, federal unemployment insurance benefits. They haven't been extended. Why are steps not being taken to ensure the extension to those who lost their jobs during COVID-19, which clearly impacts many, many communities? Well, it, it is my sincere belief that they have to be extended, and that's why we were so proud to include that extension in the, bi in the bipartisan framework we put forth that then shocked these party leaders back into action. Remember, two months ago, Nancy Pelosi and all these and everyone else had retreated to their partisan corners. The Mnuchin, McConnell, they all had gone there. They were done. And we and I worked across the aisle to shock them back into action. And unemployment was included in that. I don't subscribe to the economic theory that that during this economic crisis, the jobs are all the jobs are still there. There are millions upon millions of jobs that have ceased to exist as a consequence of this pandemic. Just think about someone who worked at a hotel. Just think about someone who worked at an arena. There's a lot of folks who don't have jobs to return to, and we shouldn't allow for them to go homeless. We shouldn't allow for them to not put food on the table. This is the greatest country in the history of the world. It's a country I would die for. It's a country I bled for. It's not a country that lets people starve. And extended unemployment benefits is such a critical part of that. Thank you so much. I actually said I was turning it over to Michelle, but I'm really turning it over to Hardis to get the next context for the next set of questions. Thank you so much for all the information you've provided, you've given our, our family members and communities a lot of information to think about. Absolutely, my pleasure. Hardis, sorry. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really, I'm, I'm taking lots of notes here. I'm, I'm really pleased to hear some of what I'm, I'm hearing. And there's so much more that our community is interested in. I wanna give you um, the context for the next set of questions um, um, by reading a statement for you. 
Um, Staten Island's North Shore faces disparities in housing, income, education, and access to essential services. When compared to the statistics of other boroughs and the South Shore of Staten Island, some of the most disturbing trends are domestic violence, child abuse rates are doubled, and infant mortality rates are much higher, particularly impacting the health and mental health of Black women in your district. Essential services are often underfunded or the funds are distributed to departments that lack the skills and the abilities to properly manage. For example, police officers respond to all types of calls, including those that might be better suited for mental health response teams. Um, our social action chair, uh, Michelle Achampong, will be our questioner for this section. I'm gonna hand it over to you, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Max. Hey. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I just want, I'm good. My first question is how do you plan on protecting public employees' jobs during this pandemic? And part two of that is does the HERO Act address the essential workers who are non uniform? So, first of all, on the point of the original HEROES Act that we passed, it had hazard pay 100% across the finish line. Uh, second of all, though, state uh, we cannot underestimate the importance of federal aid to states and localities and you have seen me all over tv fighting this fight because i refuse to sit by when people like mitch mcconnell call this a blue state issue say that this is just a democratic issue when did this ever happen in this country when when did this start it's got to end because our community is on the line more than the vast majority of others with this. Again, makes my opponent's silence in the face of the Republican Party's complete and utter disregard for state and local aid, the complete and utter lack of urgency. Remember, we passed that bill over 100 days ago. They haven't done anything. They could have done something with state and local aid. They never did. My opponent never criticized it. Never once. That's people's jobs and that's social services. That's transportation infrastructure all on the line. It's no joking matter at this point. It's none. Everything that we care about from mental health treatment to making sure that teachers and nurses and uh, public service workers, law enforcement, firefighters can get a raise. Everything so we can make sure that public housing is cleaned and, 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 and that the uh, people are going out with it without gas or heat. This is all on the line here. It's state and local aid. New York's economy is at a precipice. Is now the state and local aid ain't the only thing. It's not the only thing, but it is such an important pillar, and it's one that I will continue fighting for. Also, what is your position on investment-focused approaches to public safety, such as redirecting a portion of funding to support the creation of a citywide or statewide integrated system that is trauma-informed, culturally competent? So uh, I... Uh, I we lost him. Hi, let me finish. You know, I, I promise to to be honest and straightforward. I, I don't support defunding the police, um, and that that includes redirecting police funds for uh, to send uh, crisis groups to potentially very dangerous situations. I don't think that's fair. I'm the child of a social worker. I don't think that's very fair to social workers, nor do I think it's fair to, to law enforcement. Uh, but there are ways to absolutely to invest across the spectrum. Sorry about that. In, in, every, in, 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 a, in a manner to deal with very complex problems. But I don't think that should be done by redirecting money from law enforcement. Hi, um, there seems to be, a, oh, Michelle, are you back on? Yeah. Um, do you want me to ask the next question or do you have it? Yes. Could you ask it, please? Okay. Um, how will you address the racial uh, divisiveness, um, the tension in our communities 
And what, if any, are your plans for racial reconciliation? Well, I'm of, I'm of the opinion that we certainly have to make investments in our community. Uh, investments in everything from housing to infrastructure and, and so much else. And we certainly cannot ignore our, our history. Um, and that's a modern history as well as a long-term history. And addressing these issues and these injustices certainly has to be reflected in most aspects of our public policy. I don't think that we do the severity of those injustices. Uh, I don't think we pay respect to them unless we do. I again go back to this issue of infrastructure and the ways in which we can, we talk about transportation as a social justice issue. Look at what's happening on the, on the North Shore. People are commuting four hours a day. Look at what, what's happened. Look, look at what the potential would be if we could double the number of union members in this country. Look at what the potential would be if we could do things like put a federally qualified health center and the first floor of public housing. As I've proposed, was the first member of Congress to propose and pushing the mayor to do it, having come out of the community health center world. Doing things in an integrated and smart manner, in a robust manner, in a bold manner, I think is the pathway forward. You're muted, Nicole. My bad. Sorry, sorry about that. My bad. Okay. Hey. Sorry about that. Uh, what are your plans to address police brutality? Well, look, I, I, I am a believer that all public officials need to be held to a standard. Uh, I, I, I do think back to my time in Afghanistan uh, when I talk about the fact that I don't think someone's guilt should be presumed. I believe that people are deserving of a, a fair and honest uh, accountability mechanism. Uh, I certainly was a co-sponsor of the Justice in Policing Act where uh, we, we, we sought to dedicate resources towards implicit bias training, and, some, and, and a myriad of other factors. So there is certainly work to be done and that I think was reflected in that bill. Also, I want to find, as part of that legislation um, to pass the, to curb the gun violence in our communities, yeah, no, so that was not part of that legislation, but that is something that I think that we should be speaking about. Uh, if you look at the vast majority of guns that are retrieved from gun crime incidents on Staten Island, and uh, well, I don't have the stats available on Staten Island, but I certainly know New York citywide, uh, the vast majority uh, are, recover are, are originating from down south, uh, from outside of New York City. It's one of the reasons why universal background checks are so absolutely vital, absolutely vital in this process. Uh, when you consider the fact that we, we, we cannot just deal with this with city and state legislation. We need to ensure that no one can buy a weapon in this, in this country without going through a background check. I'm also certainly a believer in a, uh, a ban on, f on further AR-15 sales, on a ban on extended magazines and so on and so forth, and more on federal, on a federal grant for gun buyback programs. No one, nobody should live in a community where they're afraid of gun violence, nobody. And I, I certainly believe though, and this is one reason why I do remain opposed to the defunding movement, that law enforcement does play a role, a significant role in curbing gun violence and doing so in a targeted intelligence driven manner. And how will you ensure the public schools, especially those serving black, indigenous, and people of color, the children in the poorest communities can equitably receive funds for laptops and other school supplies to alleviate the educational challenges of virtual learning? Well, well look, I, I certainly believe that in a time, especially a time of a pandemic where with remote learning, I mean, I got it. Miles is eight months old. I don't know how people are doing it three kids at home, all remote learning. It's unbelievable. And to think that we would expect that somehow someone would get an adequate education without that technology in their home, 
whether it's broadband access or the availability of a tablet and so many other matters. And I think it is the responsibility of the city government, which runs our educational system, but albeit with federal funds backing them up to ensure equitable access to that technology so everyone can have a pathway to a, a strong education. And I just want to find out, Max, um, this will be the last. When you say your responsibilities, we really need to know what is it. Like, if there's a street light that's out, do I call your office? If it's Look, it, paved if, if streets, it, do I call your office? If it matters to you, it matters to me, and I want you to call my office. Now, with that being said, though, as a member of, co of Congress, I obviously have legislative responsibilities and oversight responsibilities related to the federal government. Certainly speed bump, street lights, stop signs, those are not under the federal government's purview. But I'm more than happy to work with someone directly. I'm not going to pass the buck to somebody else helping to navigate the city bureaucracy, working hand in hand with our local elected officials to get the job done so that people can be taken care of. Thank you so much. Pardis, back to you. Thank you so much. Um, this was um, very informative. Um, Congressman Rhodes, we know, and, and you've stated tonight that you take great pride in your ability to reach across the aisles. Um, you mentioned it several times in a lot of the things that you are um, want to do for um, our district. As you think about the future, how will you reshape the political party rifts and seek to build bipartisanship in our polarized political climate and as part of your role in government? Yeah, part, part of this, it's a fantastic question. And I think that we actually have a problem on the left of the Democratic Party when it comes to stuff like this. That somehow, if you want to work across the aisle, then it's clear that you, you, that you, you're not a, you don't deserve to be in the Democratic Party. But I think, and I go back to COVID relief, right? When you think about what the Democratic Party should be, the party that represents working people, Right? When you think about the, Demo that the, the Democratic Party should be a party that cares, that all elected officials should care about someone who's struggling to stay in their home, someone who's struggling to put food on the table, someone who's about to get fired if state and local aid doesn't get across the finish line. And the last thing that that person wants to hear is that somehow we let the vision of the perfect get in the way of accomplishing enough to save their jobs, to save their health care, to save their home. And so I, every day that I act, I feel a clear sense of urgency to get something done, something to help people, because I think that's why I'm in office, to try to help people. I'm not in office, though, to think about the next election. I'm not in office to delay things, because I think that it would hurt my opponent so much that they're going to lose by more. I think that that's incredibly immoral. And I think that that, that that is an injustice that doesn't do justice to what government is capable of. So when we think about bipartisanship, it's continuing to invest in our bipartisan coalitions. So we're building trust across the aisle. It's continuing to see the best in the other, not the worst. It's continuing to, despite the, the, the myriad of ways in which we may disagree, it's never closing the door on partnership and cooperation. All oh, yes, without sacrificing our values. Doesn't mean that it's possible in every issue, but damn it, it's got to be possible in something. That's what the American people deserve. That's what the people of Staten Island deserve. Thank you. Um, that was our concluding question. Um, and we definitely want to thank you so much for um, coming and, and talking with us and um, answering our concerns um, that we have as part of this community. I want to remind um, everyone of early voting. It takes place October 24th through November 1st. Um, you can find your vote voting polling place at voter look up elect voter look up dot elections New York gov. Um, and remember the general election is Tuesday, November 3rd from 6 to 9, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. And you can find your election day polling site at the same site. Um, voting is really important. Let's please get out there. Again, I want to thank you, Congressman Rose, for um, coming Absolutely. and talking to us. Absolutely. And if I could just close out by just saying one thing. I want to thank you not only for including me today, but I also want to thank you for holding me accountable. You know, I can't be the member of Congress I want to be. I can't be the member of Congress that people deserve alone. 
and, and I do that with you, with you all, such, such incredible leaders, also helping to push me to be the, 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 the representative that, that we all know Staten Island deserves. So I, I thank you all so much again, um, and, and God bless you and stay safe. Thank you so much. And um, to all our family and friends, we want to thank you for um, joining us tonight um, as we have this very important conversation. And um, please go to um, both our Facebook page, um, the Staten Island Alumni Chapter, as well as the North Shore section of NCNW for continued information and to find your polling place. So don't forget to vote. It's so important. You can start as early as October 24th all the way up to um, election day, which is November 3rd. Um, thank you and um, good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, good night. Have a great night, everyone, and thank you again. Thank you, don't forget to vote. And if you need a ride, call that number. Absolutely.